Um, my name is Deborah Wiltshire and I'm based at Gieses in Germany. So I'm the head of the Secure Data Centre here. This afternoon we're going to be looking at providing canonical training slides and materials for secure data facility professionals. Now, just a, a quick note, we are going to record the meeting if nobody has any objections to that. So if you want to just put your, your webcam off, if you don't want to be visible, then please feel free. Um, any objections, if you just pop a note in the, in the question box in the usual Zoom fashion, that would be fantastic. I would ask, for the most part, while I'm going through the presentation, if you can just put yourself onto mute, just because there are quite a few of us, and we don't want to get a lot of background feedback sound. All right, so if everybody's happy, let's get on with the presentation. So I want to start very quickly by just introducing um, shock for those of you who are not familiar with it. So this is the Social Science and Humanities Open Cloud. It is a very large EU funded project. As you can see, there's a lot of people involved. So we have 48 partners and the project has been running for quite some time now and is at the moment funded to run up until the end of April next year. If you're interested in finding out more, there is the, the project website on there. Um, and we can put that link into the chat box a little bit later for you if you're interested. The project is, is very large and it has a lot of different objectives. And this workshop today is, is a small part of those objectives, which is to try and maximize reuse of, of data and try to set up some interconnecting um, infrastructures. If you want to learn more, please do get in touch and go and have a look at the website. So just to introduce the specific part of the project that we're going to talk about today, this is um, uh, a short session, just a two hour session this afternoon. And we're going to look at the motivation behind the training materials that we've developed. So I'll talk a little bit about why we've developed them and I'll talk about how we anticipate them being used. And then I'm going to give you a guided tour of the training materials themselves. And then at the end, there's time for you to do a little bit of work. We're going to split you all off into smaller breakout groups, and we're going to ask you to have a look at the materials, to talk about them, and to, to give us some feedback. So that's how this afternoon is going to look. So what's the motivation for this? Why, why are we doing this? It's important to start by saying that providing access to very detailed secure microdata is not a new thing. There are many secure data access facilities across the world, and some have been going for many years. So this isn't new. But for many, access has been through a physical data enclave or a safe room. There are many terms, you might also hear them referred to as safe havens. Um, but essentially, this is a physical location where a researcher goes to access secure microdata. Now, in this setup, there are a lot of physical controls in place to ensure that researchers use the data safely, which is great. It's a system that's worked for many, many years. But it's not very convenient for researchers, especially if you want to access data which requires you to travel a large distance. So there's been this shift over the last sort of decade or so towards a virtual data enclave. So that might be a research, 
a remote access system, a remote desktop. Again, there are many terms, but essentially, you might be able to access a different safe room. So you might get to access a safe room in one part of the country to access data at another center. Or you might be able to access through your own institutional office through a remote desktop. There's been some great developments in this area and those that are up and running have been very, very successful and very popular with researchers, as you can imagine. But it's very important to be aware that these access pathways offer far fewer physical controls because we're not there with you. If you're accessing a secure data center through your own office, we're not going to be there. So we need to replace those physical controls with other safeguards. Now those safeguards take a number of different forms. So we look at licenses, data use agreements, contracts, etc., legally binding agreements that the researcher signs. But often these safeguards also include mandatory training for researchers as part of the application process. Now this training can cover a wide range of different topics depending on the specific requirements for that service but it will typically include information on legislative frameworks service specific information and statistical disclosure what these training courses all have in common is that their main aim is to ensure that researchers are equipped with the knowledge required to use secure or legally controlled data in a safe manner. Now, developing a set of training materials is very resource intensive. Anybody that's had to do it will, will know what I mean. And not everybody will have the capacity to start developing training materials from scratch, especially if you're a small service with a small team that's just starting to look at a remote access solution. Also, as we move towards setting up remote access connections that work across international borders, having some commonalities in the training that's on offer is of great benefit because it allows different services to be confident that researchers have received good quality training in the relevant topics, regardless of where they trained. So the aim of the training materials that I'm going to talk about today is to provide a canonical set of materials or a communal set of materials, if you like, that any secure data access service can use and adapt to their own specific needs. So just a few comments about the materials themselves and, and how we anticipate them being used. Now, the first thing to say is these materials are designed not to be a finished product, but to provide a framework for delivering training. And the idea is that these, these slides will form the basis of a training course that services can adapt to suit the specific needs of their service. Different services will need slightly different things. So these materials, these slides, they're designed to be a taught course that could work either for in-person delivery when the world calms down a little bit and we can do such things again, or online delivery. But they're designed in, with having a trainer leading the course in mind. In the slides, there are a number of notes to aid delivery. Now, these are not intended to be a verbatim script, but they're designed to guide trainers to the content and the purpose. Now, currently, the content is divided into six modules, as you'll see. And this has been done to ensure that each section covers a distinct topic, giving what I hope is a clear structure for trainers and attendees to follow. Any thoughts on that structure in the feedback session later, of course, will be very gratefully received. I just want to mention the other reason why I've arranged this in modular format. 
Now, although I, I designed these to be a taught course, that isn't necessarily going to be practical for everybody. So the module format is designed to allow the content to be adapted much more easily to an online self-study format. And again, any thoughts you have on that in the feedback session would be really, really great to hear. So just a couple of acknowledgements before we start having a look at the um, training materials themselves. Just want to say thank you to Professor Felix Ritchie, who is here today with us, who's based at the University of West England and is widely published in this field. And to Simon Parker, who I think is with us as well. Simon and I worked alongside each other at the UK Data Service for a couple of years, and he's now also over here in Germany. So I'd like to thank both of you for being very generous with your time and expertise leading up to the development of these materials. Also want to say thank you to Beata and Yara, who spent a lot of time reviewing the first draft of these materials and providing a huge amount of valuable feedback. So just wanted to say a big thank you to all of you. Okay. With all of that in mind, I'm going to run through the material. So I'm not going to deliver this as if you were attendees, because this would take much longer than the time slot we have today. Rather, I'm going to give you a guided tour so that you can see the outline, you can understand the, the topics and some of the key messages. Now, this is a working title, by the way, and it's not very catchy. So any ideas of a slightly catchier title, again, please let us know. So at the moment, the working title is Using Secure Access Data Safely, a guide for researchers. So this is the overview, the overarching structure of the course. So you can see these six modules. Module five, as I'll talk about a little bit more later, I've split into different subgroups and I'll explain a little bit about why I've done that when we get to that module. But you can see here the clear structure that I was hoping to achieve. So let's get started with the first module. Now, module one is an introduction, so it's not designed to be a very long module. Rather, it's designed to set the scene, if you like, to outline the context of everything that will follow. So in the module, we have a look at why we make secure microdata available for research. And we'll look at some of the impacts of that. And then we'll finish off the module by looking at how we safeguard or why we safeguard these data. And the aim of this module is really to start researchers thinking about the value of making secure microdata available and to introduce them to some of the concepts of data protection, safeguarding, et cetera, as we go through. So we talk about why we make secure microdata available, and this might be fairly obvious, but it's always worth, I think, starting with explaining what, what it is we're all working towards. So we would explain that society is ever changing and it's becoming arguably more complex. We can look at age structures and populations are changing and, and what that means for us. Now, as these societal changes occur, there is a greater need for very detailed microdata because that is what allows research to happen that is going to directly inform evidence-based policies. They also allow us to combine survey and other forms of data such as administrative data to be linked together, which previously would not have been possible. 
and they'll allow us to maximize the use of publicly funded data collections. So this is really where we talk about the why of what we do. And then the module moves into looking at what that means. What's the impact of that? So essentially the impact is that we see and have seen an increased demand for this very detailed microdata. And this is where we start to bring in the idea that as more detailed data becomes available, the risk of potential disclosure increases. And this is why we need to start at looking at um, appropriate safeguarding. And that idea is one of the core concepts that researchers need to be um, familiar with for the rest of the course. So we can talk about why we safeguard data. So we start with the idea that increased detail comes increased risk of re-identification. I've listed some of the common concerns about that. Now that can be changed to match the, the particular um, concerns relevant for your service. But these are some of the common ones, certainly some of the common ones that I've come up against. And then the key point at the end is that any data access solution needs to address these concerns. Again, this is something else that we want to start to get researchers to think about right at the start is that the bottom line is data breaches or unsafe practice puts all of our data access at risk. This is a non-negotiable fact, really. Um, if we get this wrong, everybody loses out. And this is a really, really good point to bring in throughout the course. So we can talk a little bit about this, but it's the, one of the things that I like to emphasize is that the public do not distinguish between things that occur, things that go wrong because of unforeseeable things or things going wrong because of incompetence or malicious behavior. And the key point really is that we need to demonstrate that we as a research community can be trusted to look after people's data. It's so easy in my experience for researchers to forget that actually the data that we use comes from members of the public. And I think sometimes we forget that. So it's really good to, to bring that concept in early. And that's the, the end of the module. Now, the summary is very, very simple. So continuously demonstrating good work and practices equals maintained access to detailed confidential data. So it's a very, very simple message, but a very, very important one because it underpins everything that follows. OK, so that's module one. Now, how long that takes to deliver will depend on, on the trainers, on the group, but it's not designed to be a very long module. Now, module two, we move on to talking about more specifically what impacts data access. So what are the sort of things that determined whether we can access this data or not? So we start by thinking about what is secure microdata? What are we talking about, essentially? We can look at some key terminology. We will look at the data access spectrum, um, why data access can be or may be restricted in certain cases. And then we can finish up by having a look at the data security modules. So again, the content of this section is is not um, necessarily very complex and it will perhaps be things that researchers know, but it's very important for them to be very conscious of this when they start to work with secure microdata. 
So we can have a look about defining what it is we mean by secure microdata. This is a, a key point actually um, that Beata added in, which is, is a really, really good point to mention, is that we can also think of the data that is held in a secure data environment as being personal data under GDPR. Now, I'll talk more about legislation later, but I think looking at the attendees today, most of us are in a country where the GDPR applies. So this will make sense to most of most people. Um, but obviously you, this can be adapted if you're using the, um, using the materials outside of the EU. It can also be useful to have a look at some of the key terms. Now, researchers may know a lot about the data, but some of these key terms can be new to people. So what's the difference between data that is anonymized and pseudonymized? That's something which trips even quite experienced researchers up. So it can be really useful to talk about those key terms so that everybody knows what they mean. And then some of you will be very, very familiar with this. So you will know exactly what you're looking at. And this is part of um, Felix's work, who's with us today. So essentially this is talking about the different types of research data that we have. So we've got source data, which is your raw data, the data that comes direct from the data collection, We'll have names, addresses, that sort of thing. Then we have secure use files, scientific use files, public use files, and web-based data. So that's the stuff that you can just go on and Google effectively. Now, this may or may not, depending on who's using the materials, some of this may need to be explained to the researchers. Some of it will be very obvious. So that's up to the individual trainer to, to gauge that. But essentially, what we're looking at is a, the spectrum which shows from source data down to web, so you've got very, very detailed data down to very, very aggregated data. So that's the detail. As you get more um, detail in the data, the risk, this red ramp, becomes greater. And that's really the key point here. The more detail, the more risk of disclosure. Now, this is an adaptation of that spectrum. And you can see the link for, for that. Um, Simon, who's with us, was part of the team that adapted the spectrum to bring it into um, a legal focus. So now we can see where the law might apply. So public use files, web-based data, that's not going to be considered personal data under GDPR. Secure use files, scientific use files may. So again, this will need to be adapted depending on the country that this training occurs in. And again, I'll come back to why I talk about legal considerations and legislation in more detail later. And then this is just a, a slide just to bring in some of the key ideas. So what are legal restrictions? Well, this is determine what determines who can share data with whom and for what purpose. It's useful to talk about incentives to share because not all data owners will have um, much incentive to share their data for a number of different reasons. And you can talk about those in the course. And then there will be perceived risk and concerns about data intruders. And the slides come with a, a small script with more details about each of those points. Now I've mentioned data intruders and, and you can let me know what you think about this later on. So data intruders is effectively people who attempt to access 
data for which they're not permitted to, or to identify people for whatever reason. Now, I've included this, and I'll talk more about the models of data intrusion, because these will have a very big influence on what data access systems are set up. So personally, I think it's worth talking about, but be interested to hear your comments. These need um, a reference to the source. Um, I will have to add that later. I forgot these, unfortunately. So the intruder data model of data security is very well documented, and it's based on a worst case scenario of somebody deliberately intending to breach data security. Now, anybody with this model in mind when they're developing a data access system will impose greater restrictions, which is why we, we mention it here. Contrast that with the human model of data security, and you can see that this is um, based on the premise that yes, people are human, but there is no malicious intent involved. So the system can be designed to address human factors like common mistakes that might be made. So if you've got a well-designed system and well-trained researchers, you can make access easier for them. You can allow greater access. And then we've just got a module summary slide at the end. And again, these can be adapted. Okay, so that's module two. Now, module three, I wanted to talk more about why I've included legislation. I've included a whole module on this. Now, in my experience, it's been very, very helpful to include a discussion on legislation. But that's based on my experience with the risk researchers that I've personally dealt with over the years. Now, this not every service will have the same audience, if you like. So not everybody is as keen as including information about legislation um, as I am, but I've included it here. So I would suggest an overview which looks at the different types of legislation that talks about legal gateways and what they mean, and then moves on to talking about legal and procedural breaches. Now, I think this module is the least polished module. So it's, it's not really as, as finished a product as the other modules. And it's, I think it's just because I'm very conscious that there will be very different views on what should and shouldn't be included. So I think it's quite useful to start with an overview. Now, again, this will change depending on the country that these materials are presented in, but essentially, it's useful for researchers to know that there are some personal data protection laws, but there may also be some statistical laws. And some of these will be European wide, some of these will be national, and they will have an impact to some degree on data access in their particular country. So I would recommend having something like this, and you can see where that table has been um, drawn from. You might also want to look at um, being a bit more general, so talking about some of the useful definitions for legal gateways. And again, this is part of the work that Simon has done with his colleagues. So you might want to talk about more general things such as the GDPR, duty of confidentiality, implied consent, et cetera. And again, that will be a very, very personal decision for the particular um, service. Now you'll see that I've included a green box in the top right hand corner. Now, most of this um, module actually, you could rather than have a separate talk module, you could include the information in a supplementary handout that you give to researchers who attend the course. That can also work perfectly well, but I would just add the caveat that we know that researchers won't always read everything you give them, unfortunately. Uh, they should, but 
you know, we're all guilty of not reading everything that we should do. Um, but this is certainly a possible option if you want to shorten the length of, of the course. Now, one of the arguments against talking about legislation, which is a good point to consider, is that most of us who deliver this kind of training, we're not legally trained and we're not legal experts. So we don't want to get too involved in the details because very quickly we're going to come unstuck. Personally, um, I've always pointed out when I talk about this in a course such as this that I'm not a legal expert and people of course are free to go away and read the full legislation um, because I haven't but I, I do like to make that very clear. If you don't want to delve into the detail then I think it's important at least to point out this one fact that legal gateways whatever they are allow for specific researchers to carry out specific research projects during a specific period of time using specific data sets. So secure data access isn't a free for all. And it's very, very important that researchers know why, I think. You might also want to make these points that different agencies will see different legal restrictions. Um, you may want to talk about that in more detail. I don't know that you really need to, but it's important that researchers know this because at the end of the day, it can impact on the feasibility of some of the projects that they want to do. It's also very important because this is the point where we start to introduce the idea that every secure data um, access facility will have a set of procedures in place and researchers need to stick to them. And this is a point at which we can say the procedures that we give you, they are determined by legal gateways and they're there to keep you on the right side of the law. So this can be your, your best friend later on down the line. We then have to talk about breaches because that is the reality of working with secure microdata. If we get it wrong, there are consequences. And some of those consequences can be quite severe. It's never happened so far. And everybody that works in this, this field is very determined that it won't happen. But it's very important that researchers know why. So we can have a bit of a discussion and then something that might be useful to do, depending on how you're delivering this course, is to do um, a, a, an exercise, a group exercise. So you might want to split people into groups, give them an example of a breach of some description, and you can tailor this to the data that you hold and the type of researchers that you get, and then ask them to discuss it. Now, I've gotten very um, into using Jamboards, and you can see the link here. And a Jamboard, if you're not familiar with it, allows um, all participants to access the Jamboard and they can write their comments on a, a, a virtual post-it note and stick it on. So this is what an example might look like. Obviously, I filled it in, so all of the answers are, are really on point. Um, slightly cheating, I know. And then again, just wrap up. Okay. So module four is looking at the five safe framework. Now again, how much people know about this in advance will vary. Um, whether you want to include it or not, again, is, is a personal decision for the service, but this is something that we've we found to be very useful over the years that we've, we've been training researchers. So essentially the module will look at what it is, we'll talk about the principles involved and how it's applied in practice. Now, the five safes is a way, for those of you who don't know, it's a way of thinking about how to arrange um, data access. It's again, it's originally derived by Professor Felix Ritchie, who's here today, 
um, during his time at the Office for National Statistics. So it's been around for quite a, a long time, I think around 2006, um, if I've got that right. And the framework is designed to, to aid decision-making processes in enabling safe use of this secure data. Now, although it was developed originally in the UK, actually it's, it's becoming much more widely used and it's, it's used worldwide now. So it's a good tool to introduce people to, I think. And it looks essentially like this. So we've got safe projects, safe people, safe data, safe setting and safe outputs and all together a combination of those equals safe use of the data. And here you would talk a little bit more about that and what that means. The next three slides will delve into each of the five safes, each principle in more detail. Personally, I like to talk about this during a course, but it could be used again as a handout. So you could take these slides out and make it a supplementary handout. It could also be a downloadable PDF if you're looking at shifting this to an online self-study course. But personally, if I'm doing this as a talk course, I like to discuss it a little bit more in detail. So we talk about what is a safe project, so something that has a valid statistical purpose. We'll talk about safe setting, which is the data access um, system, so whether that's a safe room, remote access, et cetera, et cetera. And there are an increasing number of ways to access these data now. And you can talk more or less about the ones that are relevant to you. The thing that I think is worth mentioning is that all of these will have different safeguards in place. Um, but they all have the same aim, is to minimize the risk that unauthorized people can access the data essentially. We've got our next principles, which is safe people um, and safe data. Now with people, this is one that we've always emphasized because at the end of the day, particularly when you're looking at remote access to secure data, people are a fundamental part in keeping the data use safe. So it's really, a really, really good message, I think, to focus on if you're delivering this as a course. Safe outputs, again, this is, this is quite a big focus. And we've got the next module, which is dedicated to safe outputs, what we mean and how they're assessed. So here I would spend a little bit of time, but not too much talking about that. Now, again, some of you in the audience will recognize these. Um, my reference has disappeared. I need to add that back in. So this comes from um, a paper by Felix and his colleagues. This is the original um, visual. So essentially, if you've got data that is safe, you don't need to worry about the other safes because the use of the data is always going to be safe. As you click through the slides, you will see if the data use is no longer safe, if it's more secure microdata, then the use is unsafe unless you look at all of the other safes. So that's the original version. There, oh, there's my, there's my slide. Um, reference. I thought I'd put it on there. So we have an alternative one, which was um, created by Simon and his colleagues. And this uh, has gone slightly awry with the, um, the points, but essentially this uses the same graphic, but to look at public use files, scientific use files, and secure data files in um, more detail. Now, I would recommend having one or the other of these slides rather than both. Which one you choose would depend on your own specific needs. Okay, 
So let's move on to module five, which is the biggest module. And this is the one which is currently split into subsections. Now, it's important to talk about why we have to consider safe outputs. So we have to talk about the fact that an output, which is um, a piece of research analysis, something that a researcher may want to publish or present, within that, there is the potential that there is still a risk of an individual being identified or else having an attribute or characteristic assigned to them. And the aim of self safe outputs of statistical disclosure control is to minimize that risk. Now, it's important to realize that there is no such thing as 100% safe, that just doesn't exist. Um, and it's important that people understand that. So we have this, this idea of the unprovability of safety. So the aim is rather to demonstrate that we've taken all reasonable measures to ensure the risk is minimal. Now, again, you can do a group exercise at this point if that works for how you want to deliver the course. And again, you might want to use something um, like a, a Jamboard. Now, in this example, you might want to look at um, posing the question, why should we ensure that research outputs are safe? And you might ask the groups to write up the reasons that they think um, that might happen. And I'll leave the, the link here. So if every, anybody wants to have a look at what that would look like, you can do that later on. But I'm just conscious of time, so we'll, we'll carry on. Now, statistical disclosure control will be new to a lot of people that come onto these sort of courses. I think it's a fairly small proportion that know a lot about this when they come to the training course, certainly in my experience. So it's important to explain a little bit more about what it is, when they're applied, um, and to talk about the fact that SDC rules are in line with good research practice. So this isn't a process which should in any way inconvenience researchers, even though sometimes I think when we start talking about it, they start to worry that, oh, there's rules, this is going to be difficult. This is where we reassure people that it isn't. So we'll talk about how a disclosure might occur. So for example, um, we would talk about perhaps if we've collected some information about income, we know that the average income for observations is say 43,000 euros, but we only have two observations. Now, I took part in that survey, so I know one of those people is me. I know my income is say 31,000. Therefore, I can calculate that the other person alongside me, their income has to be 55,000. Assuming my maths the other evening is correct. Now, I let her meet that other person to celebrate the launch of the data collection. And I instantly know something about that other person that really I shouldn't. Now, would that be the same if we're joined by another person who took part? Arguably, no, it wouldn't, because even if I know what one of the salaries is, I can't calculate the other two with any degree of accuracy. I can have a guess, but the chances are I'm going to be wrong. So this is where we talk about a theoretical safe threshold of three. Now, one thing it's useful, I think, to talk about before we get involved in looking at examples is to look at the different types of disclosure. So we can look at primary disclosure and secondary disclosure, and we can explain a little bit about what they are. But these are things that we come back to when we talk about all the different examples. Now, if it's relevant 
to your service, you can talk about the different models of output clearance. Now, this may or name may not be relevant, so that's free for you to decide. So if you want to highlight the benefits and the, the pros and cons of each one, if that's relevant, you can do that here. But in terms of getting researchers to understand statistical disclosure, you don't have to include this if it's not relevant. One thing which is important is we've talked about this theoretical safe threshold. Now, very few research data centers or secure data access services will actually apply a threshold that low. There are some, but they're not that common. So here it's important to point out that all RDCs who apply SDC will have a threshold and these will vary. Now it's really useful if you have the knowledge and I've included some in the, in the notes on the slide is to give some examples. So for example, Statistics Denmark do have a threshold of three. Others will have a higher one. So CBS in the Netherlands and the UK Data Service have a threshold of 10. The highest one that I know of is the um, HMRC, which is Her Majesty's Revenue and Custom in the UK, who have a threshold of 30. So it can be interesting to explain some of those differences. It's also important to talk about why we have a threshold so that researchers are aware that they're there for a reason. And then this is where we get into the practical stuff. And this is really, I think, where researchers learn the most about statistical disclosure. Now, I'm not gonna talk about all of the examples individually because there are a lot of them. So I'm gonna scroll through them as I talk about the aim so the aim is to have distinct sections which deal with a group or type of output. So we start with things like frequency tables, very, very common. And we talk about what the problems will be. Um, we'll talk about um, what can we do about that. So we don't have to throw that output away, we can make changes. Now, you can get the researchers to break off into groups and think about this and talk about that together and come up with their own suggestions, or you can talk through it. Um, we always recommend chucking in uh, an example of secondary disclosure because this is one of the most common issues in academic research results, is the combination of more than one piece of information. So two or more pieces of information can isolate um, individuals. And my circles went completely haywire there. So we can see in the circled categories, if you take table two from table one, we're left with two people in one category and one person in the other category. And this is really, really important for researchers to know. So I would recommend having a minimum of one example of this. Then we will talk about group disclosure and dominance. And again, we'll talk about what the issue is. We'll give some examples. Um, we'll get researchers to have a think about it again. You can get them to break off in, in groups if you have the time. Um, but essentially, this is just to get them understanding what it is they should be looking for, because the golden standard is that your researchers are well trained in SDC and they will carry out their own initial SDC check so that by the time the output comes up for checking, there's not going to be a problem because the researcher knows what they're looking for. Doesn't always happen, but that's that's the the holy grail, if you like, of, of an output checker's life is trying to get researchers to, to submit the perfect outputs. Talk about dominance. Dominance is actually a really tricky concept for researchers. So this is something that might need a little bit of time. And again, you can adapt the examples to match the kind of data that you get. For each of these, you'll notice that I've got um, a question mark and a, a question that pops up just to, to help trigger 
uh, both the trainer to remember what they need to be asking, but also um, an aid memoir for the researchers to, to think, oh, I need to think about dramatic change in this case. Now, you will see that we've included an awful lot of different types of outputs, which is why this section is very, very long. Now, not every service will see all of the types of outputs that I've included. So you can adapt these sections by taking out the things. So if you never see a concentration ratio, you might not want to cover that in the training. Um, but again, there are notes in the slides just to aid the trainer for what to what to pick out for the researchers. And then the next section, we look at all the different types of descriptive statistics. So we'll talk about the means um, and the medians. We'll talk about min um, and max values. And we'll talk about quartiles, etc. Now, you'll notice that I've used a couple of different. So here I've just given a description of them and potential disclosure risk. I haven't given an example. You can change that. Here I've given a more uh, detailed example for the minimum and maximum, but I've included the mean and median as well. So you could use this to refer back to the previous slide as well. Um, and then we've got um, quartiles, um, uh, quantiles, et cetera. Oh, that should be quintiles, sorry, that's my, my typing, um, and percentiles. And again, you can adapt this to match the kind of output you see. Um, but this is just an important way of getting researchers to think about all the different types of descriptives that they will produce. And the common theme is that there will be a, a bit of a description about what they are, and then there'll be a discussion about what the potential issues are. Measures of variance and distribution, again, very, very common statistics to see. Um, so it's worth spending a little bit of time talking about those. Again, I've included some notes in the slides for trainers. And then we move away from the descriptives into the regressions. Um, now, we don't deal in this. I haven't done slides for very specific types of regression. So I haven't separated linear regression from logistic regression, for example. You can, if you feel that's appropriate, of course. I'm not sure that it is. Um, because the same principles will, will occur, will be relevant to all types of regression. But again, you can add more content if you would like. So here I'm talking about a little, there's a little description of what a, a model is, what we're talking about. So we're looking at a statistical relationship between two or more variables. And there's just a summary of where disclosure might occur. And there are some, some SDC considerations to think about. These are the sort of things that an output checker will look at. And here's just an example of um, a model with some coefficients in there. And again, you can see the question pop up. Now it's worth pointing out that all of these examples are done with completely made up data. So it's completely made up statistics. So we're not breaking any um, data protection principles here. Um, it's funny how often a researcher will pop up and say, have you had that SDC cleared when we run these sorts of courses. So it's worth pointing out right at the start that all of these are done with, with example or fake data. Because you, you always get one that will ask whether you've, whether you've output checked these before 
use in them. Um, if there are some definite things that you want researchers to consider, then you can have those pop up as well. So it's not just necessarily about the stats themselves. You can start to talk about the fact that you need outputs to be clear. You need to be able to understand what you're looking at as an output checker. And that's quite a key point. So if we go on to the next slide, you can see that all of the variable names have been changed so that they are meaningful. One of the things we've always found quite beneficial when we do training such as this is to remind researchers that the person checking your output, no matter how experienced or how qualified in their academic field, they will not be experts in everything. Um, and one of the guidelines we've always given researchers is to assume that the output checker do not know what they're looking at. And their output should be clear enough for that checker to just pick it up and understand it without having to ask for further information. So we talk also about residual plots, which are very, very common to see. And we'll, again, we talk about what they are and, and what the potential problems are. Now, on that subject, if your service has very specific rules about residual plots, for example, you can add those in. And then the final subsection, if you like, of this module is to have a look at um, graphs and other outputs that don't fit into any of the previous categories. And again, you can chop and change these depending on what is relevant. So if you are working in a service which allows researchers to produce graphs within the secure environment and have those released, then you can include a discussion section on graphs. And again, we're following roughly the same format. So we're talking about what they are um, and what might be the potential issues. Now, there are many, many different types of graphs. So it's, I think, up to the individual services to, to choose some examples that is most relevant. So histograms, for example, um, is something that I personally see a lot of. So I would want to include that but there might be other types of graphs that are more common in other services. But regardless of the type of graph, you want to be doing the same thing. So you want to be pointing out what they are and what the common issues are. Again, we've got the question that pops up as an aid. Now, scatter plots is another common form which can be very, very problematic. So even if you don't see a lot of them, talking about them can be quite useful because it allows you to, to drive home some key messages. So we can talk about um, individual data points and why they're problems. So we can revisit that message. We can also talk about um, how to make them safer. So there's a follow-up example. There's been some transformation of the data and um, that's a useful tool because I think a lot of researchers are very concerned when you start talking about SDC, they start to think, oh, what happens if I can't release a piece of output? And this is just a useful way to remind them that nine times out of 10, if there's a problem with a piece of output, there is a way around it. There is some transformation or change that can be carried out to make the output safer. So it's useful to throw in a couple of examples um, which demonstrate that. Now, this is um, an interesting question, which is also something that it's good to get researchers trained to thinking about is whether they can work back to the original data points using their outputs. 
And I think that's, for a researcher, that's quite a good um, tool to use. Now, box plots, again, some people will see a lot of them, some people don't. In my experience, I haven't checked very many for SDC because the discipline of researchers that I'm used to dealing with don't tend to produce them very much. But that's obviously not going to be the same for everybody. So there's an example here. And it's just, again, we're just pointing out where the issues are. And I've just produced a little bit more explanation here about this specific example. Maps are another type of output. And again, these, these vary as to, to how many you will see. Now, point maps we, we never see. Um, and I think that's because researchers know that they are highly problematic and they are very, very unlikely to be able to be released. So when I talk about a point map, I mean a, a map which has points that represent the location of a single data point. Now, it should be very, very obvious to a researcher by now that this is going to be a problem. And again, this is another opportunity to drive that, that message home that single data points are going to be problematic. Now, you can use maps to talk about some more contextual information. So you can start to bring in the idea that actually the context is also important. So if we were looking at um, these points showing the location of, say, a hospital, we could argue that that's less problematic than if they were showing fatal road traffic accidents. However, again, this can lead into an interesting conversation about having um, publicly available data um, and whether that means you can automatically release it. So this, this map, although we don't see them as output checkers, they're a really, really good springboard for further conversation for some of the important points which is why we tend to include it. Now, at this point, how do we deal with this? Well, very simple. We point out that it's, it's safer to use an alternative type of map. And actually what we do tend to see is things like this, which are heat maps. And I think most people are familiar with what they are, but you can talk about that if not. This one, very, very topical, is looking at um, cases of coronavirus in the UK. And it's looking at the, um, the incidents rather than individual cases. It's looking at the incidence rates within <clears throat> all of the local area um, districts. So it's displayed for geographical regions rather than accept data points. So again, we want to talk about some of the um, considerations that we want to pe think people to think about. And again, you can tailor that. It's always worth mentioning things like correlation coefficients, test statistics. Now, these are all things that are generally going to be unproblematic. But there are a couple of things to think about, and we want researchers to be aware of them. So again, it's worth spending a few minutes on them. Now, um, Kaplan-Meier curves, to be honest, I don't think I've checked an output that actually includes one. But again, that's due to the nature of the researchers that I've dealt with. So I've dealt with a lot of economists and they don't tend to use them. Whereas in my own field in demography, we use them for everything. So again, the, the different outputs that you want to discuss will depend largely on the audience that you're going to get. 
But it's useful again just to have an example and talk about what they show and what the um, potential issues are. So you can see that all of these examples, they have the same format, what they are, what the problems are, and where it's appropriate, we talk about where, where they can be changed to make them safer. Now, one thing that you might want to do, which actually I think is really, really good if you're doing this as a taught course, is, and this is probably a little bit easier if you're doing it in person, um, but is to split your group into smaller groups and give them some examples of some outputs. Now, not a whole document, but maybe just one or two tables or graphs, something to get them to think about. And then you would send them off into their groups and ask them to consider the following. So do you have all of the information you need? Now, I would always give an example that doesn't have sufficient information just because in reality, not having sufficient information to make a, a proper assessment is the most common problem that we have with outputs. But generally, not problematic in terms of statistical disclosure, but they're problematic because we just don't have enough information. So that's the first thing you'd ask them to look at. Do they have all the information that they need to make a proper assessment? Then you can ask them to make a decision as a group, would they release that output or not? And then if they wouldn't, you can ask them, oh, look at that typo, why not? and what they would advise the researcher to do. Now, I like this exercise for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, it helps to consolidate the messages that we've talked about through the rest of this section. And there's no substitute, I think, for sitting down with an output and assessing it yourself to help you understand the concepts and rules of output checking. So that's a really, really important aim of, of this exercise. But the other more subliminal um, aim, if you like, of this exercise is to demonstrate to researchers the thought processes that go into checking an output. And I think that's, that's really helpful because it's very easy for a researcher who's looking at their, their research day in, day out, week in, week out. They're very familiar with it. And they forget that not everybody is as familiar with their work. So if you give them the opportunity to put their output checkers hat on, sit in front of some outputs that are potentially problematic, it starts to get them to appreciate that actually output checking it's not always a simple, quick process. Sometimes it involves a lot of thought, a lot of decision-making, um, which can be quite time-consuming. So it, it just helps to get researchers to appreciate that if they submit an output, they're not going to get it back in, in five minutes. Um, I just find that can be very, very useful. And again, that will depend on your audience and your service to some degree. Okay, so that's the bulk of the practical examples. I would include for this module a, a slight more detailed summary than the previous modules because you want to drive home some of the key messages. So you want to drive home the fact that SDC and research are compatible processes. The key things that are going to be problematic in terms of statistical disclosure are the sort of things that are going to be problematic for high quality research. And I think that's really important to drive home. It is, I think, quite reassuring for researchers to, to have this message in front of them as well. 
And then you can finish off with some general principles. So this is the general, what should I as a researcher consider before I submit an output for a check? So I should be sat there thinking, has this piece of output, has this statistic been presented clearly? Have I provided the, the number of observations? Are they sufficient to meet whatever threshold I'm working with? Can I work back to the underlying data without an unreasonable amount of effort or knowledge? Um, and I think what's good for researchers to think about is if I, as a researcher, were one of those data subjects, would I be happy for my personal data to be, be presented in this way? And I think making that connection for the researcher back to the original data subject is, is very important. So that's, that's the, the bulk of the course done and you can quite happily leave it at that if you if you wish i would recommend adding a one last module onto any training courses of this nature now you can see i've put a, a green box up there just for um uh, an aid memoir but essentially this module is entirely optional I don't think you, it's required in order for the researcher to complete any safe researcher type course. And it's certainly not required for a researcher to understand data protection, statistical disclosure. So you can safely leave this module off. On the other hand, from personal experience, actually, I think this can be a very, very useful module. So I personally recommend having this. Now, its purpose is to provide additional service specific information. And experience has shown that it can be really, really useful for both researcher and the secure data access facilities staff alike to ensure that at an early stage, researchers know what to expect from that facility from that service before they get started on their research. So if, for example, they know in advance what output checkers will expect to see on an output, it's much easier for them to produce an output that meets the requirements and that can be released much more quickly, which is ultimately what um, every researcher wants. Likewise, if they know that they can bring in external data or they can't, they can plan their research properly to ensure they take that into account. So this is optional, but personally, I would highly, highly recommend including it. Now, it's hard to provide a, a module that will fit everybody because every service will be entirely different. So I've just started off with giving you a possible content list for such a module. And these are the sort of things which I think are useful in my experience, but of course there may be others that I've, I've missed. So you might want to talk about the software that's available in your particular um, setting. You might want to talk about whether there's any service specific restrictions. You hopefully will have already talked about individual thresholds because again, as I mentioned, they will be different, but this could be a good place to, to reiterate that. <clears throat> if there are any specific data security rules. So if you have, for example, a safe room, a physical data enclave, are there any rules about taking your bag in there with you or your mobile phone or your laptop? If so, it's useful for researchers to have that information before they turn up on the day. Something that we found very useful is to have some top tips for working efficiently in that secure data environment. Um, they will be very, very personal to your service, but they can be very, very helpful. 
you might want to talk about the process for requesting any additional data sources or how you add new people onto your project or how you go about requesting outputs. All of those things, again, will be very different. So it's a good point here to include those. If there are any output requirements in addition to the SDC rules that we've talked about in the previous module, you might want to talk about them here. And that could be something um, like if you allow graphs to be produced within the secure data service and then release as outputs, if you want them to be released only as a fixed image rather than copy and paste direct from, from Stata, then that's the sort of thing you can include here. And again, that's going to be very specific. A really, really important thing to talk about is what support is offered and how researchers can contact you, the support team. Um, very, very important. If there's a way which is easier for you, um, for researchers getting in contact, make sure you highlight it here. Otherwise, researchers, quite rightly, will just find the first available option, and that might not always be the most convenient one. Finally, I've put a note about post-course assessment. Now, I think most services I know that already include this type of training, they will have some sort of post-course assessment. Now, again, um, that will vary from service to service as to how that works. Um, but it is a good idea to have a post-course assessment of some sort, whether that's something if you're doing in-person training courses, whether you want to get them to do it there and then before they leave for the day, or whether you give them the option to do it online later on, that, that's really up to individual services. But if you have a post-course assessment, then this is a good time to talk about it what's expected, how they, um, <clears throat> how they need to complete the course assessment. Researchers always want to know how long they've got to take, to take the test. So do they have to do it straight away? Do they have a few weeks, few months? When they start the test, is there a time limit on the, on the course? So do they have half an hour, an hour or unlimited? All of those sorts of things they want to know. They generally also want to know how quickly they'll get their results. So all of these things you can include. Now, just as an example, I've done a few slides which show uh, an example of how such a module might start. So this isn't a complete module, but it's just a few slides to, to give you a, a visual idea of what they might look like. So again, you start with your module overview. So you, you want to talk about how secure access works, how to use the, the virtual machine or the environment, how to request outputs or additional um, data, key things to remember, and of course, the course assessment. Now, this will be entirely specific. So I base this loosely on the Secure Data Center here at Gizes, just because that's where I work and, and that's what I know. Um, so here I would start off by outlining the different access pathways and I would talk about some of the differences between those pathways. Um, because that can be important for researchers to know so that they can make the right decision about what's most appropriate for them. I would start to flag that there are some bilateral agreements being developed to re allow remote access across national borders or international borders might be a better way. Um, again, that's entirely unique to your particular service. Um, at the moment, obviously, I think most of us will still have a note to say that our safe rooms are currently closed due to uh, COVID-19. 
so again, this is very specific to, to my environment, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the sort of things that you could include. And then I have used the, the link um, from the UK data service as an example, just because we don't have one of these yet um, and the UK DS does. So if you have a video demonstration of your particular secure data environment, it can be really useful to include it. Um, something that I, I think is really, really helpful to have. Um, and the UK DS have a very good one, voiced by James Scott, who is with us as well today. And I'm, I'm here as Libby today. Yeah, I noticed you've called it uh, Libby. I, I wasn't going <laughs> to... That, that confused me for a minute, but yes. <laughs> so again, if you want to have a look at the video, I've included the link um, for you. It's about, I think, just over seven minutes long. Seven. Yeah, I think it's about seven, seven and a half. I've actually got to redo it uh, again. at some point. And again, um, because we've just updated our website and the, it looks completely different from the logging in. I mean, actually, the process is exactly the same, but I guess just to tie everything up so it looks right, I need to do it again. Yeah. Um, but yeah. But yeah, no, we've done it a few times over the years and it, it seems to be well used. And I think it's it's really valuable for, for users mm -hmm. for sure. I think it is. And there is a slight drawback that if you change anything, you have to re-record them. Um, but I do think it's quite useful because certainly I think James would agree with me and, and Simon and I think Beata is with us as well, would agree that all researchers want to know what it looks like and how to use it. And we, we, we have always been asked by researchers to give a live demonstration, which of course, for security reasons, we can't do. So this video stands in as a very good um, proxy for that. Okay, so I think I'm, that's the end of the materials themselves. I'm gonna give my voice a little bit of a break short, very shortly um, before I lose my voice all together. So just a couple of final comments on the materials before I ask you to go off and, and discuss them. Um, just to remind you uh, that the materials, the, the slides are designed to form the basis of a course that will train researchers to use secure microdata safely. So just bear that in mind when you have a look. Um, Secure data access facilities are able to adapt them. And the idea is that they should form the basis and then you can just tweak the various sections to make them match or fit in more accurately with your own service. I've mentioned um, course assessments already, so I don't think I need to just repeat that, but just bear in mind that all of this content can be um, adapted and included on a test. Um, okay, so I'm gonna hand this over to you and I'm going to have a quick um, break, although I will pop in and out of the group. So I think Serenella is going to split you off into five different breakout groups. This is slightly changed because Jamboard was, was having a funny five minutes earlier. So Anna has very kindly provided some Google documents for each um, group. What I would ask you to do is to talk about the materials. I can leave them up on the screen if anybody wants me to. I can keep scrolling through them if that's useful. And what I want to know really is any comments, any feedback that you have. So what do you think works well? Do you think actually there's, there's a point to doing all this? Um, are they going to be useful? Are there any things that you think don't work or, uh, or aren't really necessary? Is there anything you think I've missed that you think should be added? Um, but don't constrain yourself just to those. So if you want to talk about any other comments, any other feedback, 
everything is is very welcome um this is essentially this is our 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 draft version so we'd be really interested to hear what you think even if you don't deliver this kind of training or you haven't been through this kind of training it would be really interesting to know as a newcomer to this content whether you think it's clear whether you think it would work for you as a potential researcher okay hopefully that's clear um, so I'm going to send you all out into groups. I would ask that in your group, you just quickly nominate a spokesperson because we'll allow you about 15 minutes to talk through them. And then um, I'll ask each of the spokesperson just to give us a quick headline. Of